Okay, students, uh, this is uh, lecture 10, uh, and it is starting the big chapter 3 in the textbook. And so we'll be getting uh, through the first part of this chapter uh, today, in today's lecture, and later in the week I will be posting a new lecture, lecture 11, um, that should hopefully get through the rest of the chapter. Uh, so this, the overall chapter is on the synthesis of metamaterials using planar technology. Uh, and planar technology, what we mean by that is either transmission lines or printed circuit boards, various other sorts of things that you can make it um, uh, in, in a single plane. Uh, all the components that you need, whether they're split ring resonators or inductors capacitors, you can use planar, a very convenient, low cost um, uh, planar technology. So that's what uh, chapter three focuses on how you make left handed. Uh, materials and also just single negative structures, uh, but both both left-handed with both uh, parameters epsilon and mu being negative, as well as uh, single uh, negative structures using planar technology. We will be looking at two types of planar structures. Um, type one will be a dual transmission line, uh, where we simply have a transmission line and we put within that transmission line various inductors and capacitors that produce. The necessary negative mu neg and negative epsilon such that we have a transmission line that supports backward propagation. We've seen up uh, in chapter two that we can put in uh, split ring resonators into our structures and, uh, and get a backward propagation. So we'll be also looking at uh, a second type of structure, namely transmission lines based on split ring resonators. All right, so we'll cover both of those. But let's start with dual transmission line first. Okay, so the dual transmission uh, line concept that supports backward wave. Um, this is not a new concept and the book goes into quite a bit the history of folks um, looking at this, uh, these types of phenomena, um, but they didn't really necessarily at the time uh, connected up with negative epsilon and negative mu. It was just wave phenomenon within transmission lines, um, but it took a little bit later for folks to realize, well, essentially what you're doing is creating a negative mu, negative epsilon simultaneously structure um, that has very unique properties. So a transmission line composed of a ladder network of alternating shunt connected inductors and series capacitors will do the trick. All right, so, um, so here are the shunt connected capacitors, and here are the series connected, I'm sorry, the shunt connected inductors and the series connected capacitors right there. All right, so we'll see how that uh, does the trick. Um, so this shows several uh, unit cells of the structure. Uh, where you're splitting up, uh, this can either be lumped or distributed, we'll go into that later. Uh, the T-circuit the model equivalent of this is given by this right here. All right, um, okay, so that's that should be obvious. <laughs> so um, figure, figure A is the backward, is the wave that supports the backward uh, propagation, and B is the one that's forward propagation. We'll use both of these uh, in the next section um, or throughout this this uh, lecture. So, but we're aiming for this, but we're always going to get a little bit of this mixed into it. So, all right. So, circuit A uh, has the backward wave propagation, and it's the dual of circuit B. All right, sort of the um, inverse. All right. So now we can use the theory of uh, periodic structures uh, and we find that the phase constant beta and the impedance of the transmission line uh, is given by this right here, all right? Um, and this, okay? Where Z sub S is the series impedance of the unit cell, Z sub P is the shunt impedance of the unit cell, so we can we know what those are for these two uh, for these two 
uh, unit cells. See, very easy. We can plug that in, and we have uh, this for the left-handed, this for the right-handed. Cosine beta L is equal to 1 minus 1 over 2 LC W squared. All right. We're going to make this, this definition right here. Um, and so we'll be able to set and put that in to this right there. Um, and the impedance uh, is given by this. All right. Given by this right here. Um, all right. So... The important thing here is that we see that we have an omega squared on the denominator, on the denominator, whereas in the right-handed structure, it's on the numerator. All right? All right? Um, but this is largely the same, 1 over LC. All right? But we have the, the 2 on the denominator, where it's on the numerator here. Okay, but it's this, this that's going to uh, play a big role, being on the denominator, for left-handed and being on the numerator for the right-handed uh, propagating structures. All right. So if we are to plot out these dispersion curves, uh, this is what we get. We get uh, figure 3.2. Um, now, so they sort of mess this up. Well, not really. It's just inconsistent. A is the forward um, or right-handed structure. All right. And we see that we have typical dispersion curve here. Um, and we, where we have a positive slope, a slope that's greater than zero, and therefore we have energy flowing in the positive direction. Um, we also have beta on that side, beta being positive as well. So both beta and, um, so both phase velocity and group velocity are greater than zero, as you would expect from a right-handed forward propagating structure. All right? That's not what you see on structure B, because if you look at energy flow going in the positive, say, x uh, hat direction, that means that you're looking for the line that has the uh, greater than zero slope. That's on, uh, that's on this, uh, this side right here, and therefore your beta is negative. So you have a negative beta and a positive energy flow um, and therefore, those two are in opposite direction, and you get left-hand-handed wave propagation in this waveguide, in, in this transmission line. All right. Um, so that's what you get. Um, and here are the impedances as well. You get the typical impedance uh, for the right-handed uh, structure up until when you have cutoff. Uh, and likewise, uh, here you get a cut on for where uh, above omega CL, sub CL, uh, you can have this backward wave propagation. All right. So there you go. So now if you purely have this, this structure, you will get left-handed um, backward propagation. Okay, but you always have a little bit of both mixed in. So, okay, so in the long wavelength, wait a minute, we can look at both of these. Um, uh, for the right-handed um, propagating model, transmission line, you get this. Cosine for small betas is just one minus uh, the argument squared over two. The ones disappear, the negatives cancel out. You can multiply by 2, divide through by L squared, take the square root, and you get this for your beta, uh, and this uh, for your, also for the long wavelength limit, you can, uh, you easily get this for the impedance, all right? Which is perfectly fine, it's what you expect. These things are independent, largely independent of frequency, uh, and so it's all good, all right? And you see that you have a positive here, and so your you can calculate phase and group velocities as you typically do, and get uh, phase velocity is positive and given by what you would expect, and the group velocity uh, being equal to the phase velocity for this forward propagating structure. Okay, all being what you would expect. For the backward line, though, you get something different. Um, so, so 
we've already pointed out that when you look on figure two and find the region of the curve with the group velocity greater than zero, then your beta is going to be less than zero. So they're in the opposite. So your phase velocity, group velocity will be in the opposite direction. If, on the other hand, you look for the group velocity being in the minus, say, x hat direction, you'd be looking over here and you see that whereas your group velocity will be in the minus x direction, your phase velocity will be positive. So they're again in the opposite direction. So depending on the frequency um, uh, that you look at. So that was right here. And that's what this is saying. Right here. Thus, the flow of energy and the propagation of the wave fronts are in opposite directions. All right, you can do the same thing like you did for the forward propagating wave. For, um, for long wavelengths or small betas, you can expand the cosine, um, and then you get this, and then you work with this, uh, and you find that you have to take the negative root right here, all right, uh, for you to get the right answer. Okay, so you get cosine of this, and then you get uh, this right here, but cosine is always less than one, all right? Um, and so then you get uh, this being equal to this right here, and your beta L is equal to minus. So, um, right, and so you, you get this right here, um, and you get the group velocity uh, is equal to the derivative of beta with respect to omega to the negative one, and uh, you get the an opposite sign, okay? Um, in the book, they take the negative, but you could actually take either one, as I'm realizing now. You could take either one, and um, this derivative will take care of the sign. So if you take the negative here, you'll get a positive. If you take the positive, you'll get a negative. So actually, either one is perfectly fine and consistent with the left-handed propagating wave uh, or structure of this one. So thus, VPL and VGL have opposite sides. Um, okay, so the next step that you have to do is to um, translate this, these results, into terms we are used to in waves um, or with materials that support wave propagation. So uh, are used to for wave propagation in bulk media, namely, uh, namely with these two parameters, the magnetic permeability and the electric uh, permittivity. Okay. So we, with the circuit analysis type thing, you have the impedance and the admittance, uh, and and so you then connect up those parameters with this. So you see. Um, that, that there is a connection right, right here between the series impedance and the um, magnetic permeability. And the par uh, parallel uh, admittance with the electric permittivity. So there's a connection between those four things, uh, the connection between mu and Zs Epsilon and mu p. All right. So applying these, um, we see that applying these uh, to both the forward and backward transmission propagation uh, transmission lines, we have that in the forward uh, your your series um, is a is a inductor, and, and so uh, you will have mu is equal to um, one over j omega, and a zs as well is uh, one over j uh, is j omega l. Uh, so those cancel out, and you get mu effective is l over w. Likewise, uh, for epsilon. Epsilon you see for the forward transmission is C over L. All right. Um, okay, fine. And it's flipped for the um, backward transmission line where epsilon is minus 
1 over omega squared L, capital L, lowercase L, or L's the length of your unit cell. Um, and omega and uh, mu is equal to minus 1 over omega squared CL. All right? Both are negative. Um, both are negative. All right? So, and, but also note that you have a omega squared on the denominator. All right, where you don't have an omega dependence here in the forward line transmission. All right. Okay, so um, this is when you have right here when you have inductors um, when you have inductors in the structure uh, as shown in Figure three point two, uh, not Figure three point two, in three point one. Um, when you have inductors, you can go back up. Right here. So when you have discrete components uh, L and C in these locations, uh, you have the equivalent epsilon and mu. All right. But the um, so say you're going for this type of model. But even if you do your very best, your host wire is going to have some inductance just associated with the wire. It's going to have some L that shows up here, it, uh, and it'll show up uh, in series here, okay? And that's going to be bad, but it's, it's, uh, you can't avoid it because you always have, the host wire will always have some inductance associated with it. Uh, likewise, you'll always have some capacitance uh, uh, from the ground to the transmission line, all right? So you'll always have uh, this C somewhere within here. So the host wire has some parasitic inductance and capacitance associated with it that's going to offset or sort of tr uh, fight to a certain degree the left-handed nature of, of what you're trying to engineer a left-handed transmission line. All right. So an omission from the from our analysis so far is the, is the set of effects of the accompanying host line which is what I've just described over the last couple of minutes. This host line can impart right or left-handedness into the system. All right. So we're looking at, say, say we're trying to engineer a left-handed material, but like I said, you'll always have some inductances within the host line, some capacitance between the line and ground uh, that, um, that sort of counteracts this. So here's the model that includes those, call, call them parasitic effects, the L sub R, this is a T model, uh, and the C sub R, that um, if they dominate, it would switch the entire structure over to a typical uh, forward or right propagating transmission line. All right. And um, so we're going to take a look at when those dominate relative to when the CL and LL dominate. All right. So the L sub R and C sub R are the forward or right propagating parameters, whereas the LL and the CL are the backward or left propagating parameters. So this is now the complete circuit for this, and, and then you have to measure and assess what each one of these things are. Uh, this is then called a composite right-left handed transmission line, or a CRLH. Right. So um, transmission line. So the dispersion relation uh, is and the impedance, those are, as you would expect, more complicated, and they're given by they're given by this. So, so this right here and this right here uh, for the dispersion relation and for Z sub B. So and then we've made various definitions of omega R, omega L. Omega R is what you would ex uh, expect one over. L square root L R C R omega L is similar but with L's here, um, and then the omega S and omega P are when you split this thing, when you change these, you have L sub R C sub L, L sub L C sub R. All right. So we will see that at low frequencies, um, as you would expect from. Uh, These is from where? Where is it at? Yeah, 
here. I, that's right. From right here, at low frequencies, uh, these terms are going to blow up because this is on the denominator, where these go away because they're on the numerator. Uh, and that carries over to the composite. Uh, when you see that at low frequencies, it's the left-handed uh, parameters that dominate. All right. Um, so as you let omega go to zero, uh, this blows up, this blows up, um, uh, such that you can neglect the one, the one, and uh, then you'll do a lot of cancellations. You'll, you'll and and um, what you see is that CL and LL are dominant, uh, and there is backward wave propagation at low frequencies. But at higher frequencies, uh, above the stop band, uh, the effect, which we'll calculate here in a moment, the effects of the host line manifest and the wave is forward propagating. All right. Okay, low frequencies, left-hand propagating, high frequencies, right-hand propagating. The gap. <laughs> All right, there is um, a frequency gap for which you don't have propagation. Um, and the gaps are given by uh, the frequencies that satisfy this. So omega G1 is the lesser of the two, uh, omega S or omega P. All right, so you, you calculate those two given uh, this in here, and you find the smaller of the two. And that is your omega G1. Whereas the larger of the two gives you omega G2. So between those two frequencies, uh, you don't have propagation. Um, okay? It's for this transmission line. Um, okay. Uh, so below that, uh, that frequency, below omega G1, you see that this is a positive slope. So you have the group velocity in the positive, say, x direction. But your beta is negative, so it's a left-handed material or transmission line. Whereas above that, uh, both the beta and the slope or the, or the group velocity is greater than zero. It's a right-handed uh, propagation. Uh, so the impedance is here. So only when the impedance is real is it plotted out. So you see that not at, not at all of these uh, frequencies will you have a wave that can propagate only when but only when uh, Z is real. <clears throat> so in the long wavelength limit, we have we can express it like this. Uh, very easy to go. Long wavelength limit. Uh, so you can take this and uh, look at um, the long wavelength limit uh, or small betas. Um, and, and find that... Uh, it converges to this right here, um, where beta is negative, such that you're on this side of the curve. Uh, if, you, if your omega is below the gap, is, is below omega G1, whereas it's positive, such that you have positive betas for, uh, if you're operating a frequency greater than WG2. Right? So... <clears throat> Uh, you can calculate V sub P and V sub GR as before, um, but now for this composite uh, left, right, right, left-handed uh, transmission line, uh, and you will find that the left-handed behavior for for frequencies less than omega G1 and right-handed behavior for omega greater than omega G2. All right. Now this is interesting. Uh, determining the effect of epsilons and mu's is quite easy, actually. You just simply add the effects separately of the, the different um, components, all right? Um, so typically for the um, forward propagating transmission line, epsilon effective is just C sub R over L. And for the backward propagating transmission line, it's minus 1 over omega squared, L sub L, lowercase l, all right? So when you now have them both mixed together, you just simply add the two of them. And that's, so it's quite quite easy to do that. Um, all right, so that's what you have. An interesting case happens when omega s is equal to omega p. Let's set that equal to omega naught. When this occurs, there is no forbidden band. And the wave, uh, as the frequency is varied, 
changes from backward propagating to stationary right at this frequency to forward propagating, all right? And the impedance reaches a maximum at this omega naught and is real, all right? However, the beta is zero, so it's, it's kind of like the phase fronts are stationary. But um, the slope, so here we go. Uh, this is called the balanced transmission line. Um, and we see that the group velocity certainly is positive, all right? Um, but your beta is zero. So there is there is energy flow in the system, even though uh, the waves themselves are not moving. Um, so extraordinarily interesting. The phase velocity is zero. Um, so uh, another other important properties of this balanced uh, right-left handed -hand transmission line are near omega naught ZB is not very dependent on frequency. This therefore allows uh, a broadband impedance matching. So quite useful uh, for transmission line implementation um, for applications of transmission lines where you need impedance matching over a wider bandwidth. You can implement this type of circuit uh, to get that. So at omega naught, the effective wavelength goes to infinity um, and therefore epsilon and mu uh, are essentially zero, okay? And uh, and so that's making a um, a n uh, that goes up to um, goes to zero. So and therefore lambda effective, which is lambda over n, uh, goes to infinity. But there is definitely energy flow in this structure, so it's very very interesting. Okay. So now that we've done that, uh, let's talk about the practical implementations of backward transmission lines. So two types of real structures will be considered in this section. Um, like I said before, the, um, the composite right-left-handed uh, transmission lines and the case when the host line is loaded with SRRs. So type one, dual transmission lines. The host propagating media can, uh, medium can be any type of planar transmission line, any type, all right? The, uh, but the reactive elements can either be lumped, which are surface-mounted uh, components, uh, discrete surface-mounted components, uh, or distributed components uh, that are electrically small, all right? So, um, so, a type of dual transmission line structure using a microstrip uh, with uh, interdigitated capacitors for uh, CL and grounded stubs for LL are shown is shown in this figure. Now these figures in this chapter are not very good. Um, this one's actually a little better because we see in the blow up everything we need um, to see. So we have um, CL, which given all by right here. LL are the grounded stubs. That's harder to see, but I would assume it's this white space that goes from the line uh, down to the ground. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what's not shown is uh, your CR and parasitic CRs and LRs, um, but they're produced. They're there. Um, they're produced by other aspects of the structure, but they're always, always say associated with. You always have them. Um, so you have this. Um, and so then figure 3.7 in the book, they have a um, typical frequency responses for nine cell balanced for A and unbalanced for B. All right. So, um, so this is, you're looking at transmission S21, and you see that uh, you do not have any uh, gap in the transmission. This is uh, very, very high. Um, and, but you do have this gap right here for the unbalanced, all right? And that's because you have the band gap, the, the forbidden band opening between omega G1 and omega G2, all right? So that's, that's the difference between balanced and unbalanced. All right. So a coplanar waveguide structure, uh, and its radiation diagram are shown below. The capacitance CL and uh, inductors LL 
to produce a backward wave structure are clearly evident. Okay, so here's another structure um, that uses a coplanar waveguide structure. So you have uh, two, two lines here. Um, so a coplanar waveguide structure, so plane one, plane two, uh, stubs between them, um, and you have capacitances uh, in between. All right. Um, and so therefore, you can get backward wave propagation. So uh, you'll have the wave traveling in one direction and energy flow being emitted. Um, uh, anti no, I mean, not in the same direction as the phase velocity. Um, so that's the coplanar waveguide structure. So two-dimensional planar metamaterials. Okay, so now this is... Um, okay, so now... Um, we go to two dimensions. Um, in theory, it's rather easy to go from 1 to, 1D to 2D structures, um, and also it's kind of structurally. But however, you have to be really, you have to be careful, or you'll get results you don't expect. Uh, in fact, Smith did this in his first paper, in his 2001 paper. Um, now, a very interesting structure that's looked at a lot with metamaterials. And in fact, it was even in Bolanus' book. Um, is this what's called a mushroom structure uh, in the field of metamaterials. And it's shown in this figure 311. Um, and it looks like an array of mushrooms, patches. All right? And you can either have these caps or you do not. All right? I think the very first structure may not have had the, these, pa these caps, as they're calling it here, just the top patches. And so you get the, um, it's quite easy for, uh, this is an obvious two-dimensional implementation of, um, of uh, figure 3.1. And I will go back up to all of you. Okay, because uh, you have the studs that are the, you have the studs that the, the inductors uh, produces L sub L. And then you have the capacitance from plate to plate. Uh, but now in both directions, um, that are your C sub Ls. All right, you have the series capacitance, uh, the parallel, um, the shunted inductors, and the ground plane. All right, so you have everything you need. Uh, very easy implementation uh, uh, to get a left-handed material. You will invariably have some uh, impedance of the patch, capacitance of the uh, posts, so, you, so this will invariably be a composite right-left-handed structure, uh, not just purely a left-handed structure, again, because you have those parasitic effects. That's all fine. Um, so good. So the transmission line model of this composite structure is exactly what you would think, but now it's in two dimensions. All right? So you have um, the left-handed one, uh, CL and LL, but now you have it both in the X and the other direction, the Y direction. Uh, but then you have the right-handed uh, parameters too, um, L sub R and C sub R right there. Okay, that you can't avoid. So you'll have that. So here's the dispersion curve uh, for this type of structure, showing uh, difference between balanced, where uh, right at the omega point, um, zero. They meet up right here, okay, for the balance, but for the unbalanced, they do not. You have this uh, forbidden frequency range between frequency, I can't even see that, uh, R1 and frequency R2, right? So unbalanced and balanced for this mushroom structure. Okay, and so then you can uh, get more capacitances and lower these frequencies by putting in caps. So with the caps, you have everything occurring at lower frequencies. Without the caps, they're at higher frequencies. So you generally want to go to lower frequencies such that you can make these things electrically small relative to electrically small, period. Uh, and that helps you uh, get a, um, a surface that looks more like a continuous surface from the perspective of the wave that it's interacting with. So, okay. So this is, um, okay, so this is uh, from the circuit diagram, modeling the circuit diagram, where this is full FEM, full wave implementation. 
All right. Turns out uh, doing FEM simulations of this, and I'm not surprised because I always uh, like FEM simulations. Um, it's far more accurate, um, and not just like uh, changing a few um, a few percent uh, on the frequencies, um, but also uncovering entirely new modes that were not there before. All right. And so here, you, you have this mode uh, up here, uh, but you have these other modes that, uh, this mode right here, that wasn't even in the circuit analysis. All right. So, um, and that's because uh, in the circuit analysis, you're really only looking at uh, the transmission line itself. But you have these other modes in air, uh, the air modes, air mode, air mode, that interact with this, uh, with the modes in the, structure and uh, allow for these other modes to exist. So the full FEM modeling is really needed for this mushroom structure. Um, okay, so I'm going to assign a homework and uh, and uh, that is the first part of chapter three. Very good.